Just open my eyes that I may see. Lead me, oh Lord, won't you lead me? Now, last Saturday. Believe it or believe it not, I was singing a couple of songs. And the song I sang, first and foremost, was Jingle Bells, Jingle Bells, Jingle All The Way. <laughs> yes, that shocked you, didn't it? <laughs> the next one was the first Noel Ying. <laughs> Hopefully a bit better than that. <laughs> yes, last Saturday, I was singing Christmas songs. Now, for those who were in attendance this morning, know that I had a bit of a collision on last Saturday. <laughs> I had a day out last Saturday, you see, and I had reason to get somewhere, and I had a collision with a bird. <laughs> Everybody here this morning will inform you of that, but we, having made my way to the destination, I was singing Christmas songs because I received a Christmas present. And so I felt it was only right to get into the spirit of the thing. And, uh... We know the rest, I sang a song. And the Christmas gift I received, you see, was a gift of an experience. Now, it had taken me this long to book this thing. <laughs> I'm a bit slow off the mark. But the experience was to go on a steam train, you see. And the steam train was to be in uh, Stoke-on-Trent. And uh, I'd never been on a steam train before. Has anyone been on a steam train before? It's a, lo it's a lovely experience. <laughs> and uh, oh, I was well in my, I was in my element. We were at a place, a place called Foxfield Railway. And it's only, it only just a 45 minute journey, so it's pretty quick. But uh, I was sitting there, I, I didn't know you got your own carriage. I was very impressed with that at your own door. I felt like Sherlock Holmes. I thought there'd be a murder next door in the next carriage. And <laughs> it was one of them. I was, I was very impressed like a child. <laughs> but the gift was that of an experience. Now, I don't know whether you've given these gifts to family or friends. You can do helicopter flights, you can do all sorts. They are a little bit expensive. They can be. But uh, a gift of an experience. I'd never given one and I'd never received one. So it was a lovely, a lovely present to finally fulfil. And it set me thinking about the gift of an experience. It's not like your regular gift where you get a pair of socks. It's something that's practical and something you can remember and something you can take and some news. It may be of use in your life. And it suddenly occurred to me, well, I really ought to start giving out these gifts of experience because they're a bit better than the usual stuff I give away. And then I, it dawned on me that maybe already we give out the gift of experience or a gift which may be used in practical terms. And indeed, it's, it's the greatest gift, the greatest gift of all, which is, if we haven't gathered already, prayer. Prayer is the greatest gift that we can give. And the specific prayer I allude to this evening is that of intercessory prayer. Now, it is defined, intercessory prayer is the act of praying to a deity, they state in the, in the dictionary, on behalf of others. We pray to God on behalf of others. Now we all know this has been practiced by the best of saints. And it is commended to us at the earliest part of the Bible. Indeed we know of Abraham. Abraham who prayed for Ishmael that a blessing would come on him. Even though Mary and Sarah was to give birth to Isaac. Indeed Abraham goes on a little later with a more incessant prayer for others. We hear how he pleads with God for the city of Sodom. The city of Sodom, which is in not the best state, is it at all? There's evil going on, the sin rife, and God is determined to bring the end of Sodom. But we hear Abraham plead with God. God, if there is but... 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom. Save it. 
God thinks and says, well, if there are 50 righteous people, then I will not destroy it. Abraham goes a bit further then. Well, God, forgive me, but if there are 45 people righteous, please save it. Okay, says God, well, if there are 45, and we know Abraham pleads for 40. He pleads for 30 people. He pleads for 20. And continues pleading. The reality is, Abraham's pleading for people that he didn't know. He's saying if there are 50 within the place that are righteous, please save, save the place, save the city for them. Abraham pleads on behalf of others for their good, for their sake, when he doesn't even know them. Moses, on the mount. Once again, God is not happy with the Israelites. And Moses says, spare them, Lord. And if you will not, blot out my name as well. He pleads again. The Old Testament is abounded with pleadings for others. Moses and Aaron are often heard and read to be on their faces, pleading with God. Moses pleads for Miriam when she's struck down with the leprosy. Please clear it of her, for God. Not only the Old Testament, but the New, of course. Peter, Stephen, Paul, who we heard and will address accordingly. But of course, we cannot forget the greatest interceder of all, Jesus Christ. The mediator on our behalf to Almighty God. We've had our intercessionary prayer this evening, but we've also had an intercessionary prayer prior to that. The prayer which the Lord Himself gave to us, His prayer, the Lord's Prayer. How does it start? Our Father, who art in heaven. Not my Father, their Father, but our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Not give me, give him or her, give us. Forgive us our sins. It's a public prayer. It's one made which we all say, which is for everyone. We plead to God for us all. And of course, the greatest and the most selfless act of intercession that we will ever read within the Bible, again from Jesus Christ, upon the cross, which we've mentioned many times again, but it's always worth mentioning again, isn't it? The Lord upon the cross pleads for them again. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. At the end of his earthly life, the Lord makes an intercedence for others. As I said, the most greatest <clears throat> selfless act of intercession that we've ever had. So when we look at two types of intercessionary prayer, we have those for whom are regarded as sinners and those who may be regarded as saints. We heard in our first reading this evening from Job chapter 42, 7 to 10, read for us by Don, of Job and his three friends. Job, as we know, went through a whole heap of affliction in order to establish and prove his loyalty to God. He wavered at times, but ultimately came through. But not with much help from his friends, was it? His friends questioned him. Surely you must have done something wrong. Surely, if God is treating you in such a way, you must have sinned. He hadn't. We know he hadn't. But they questioned it. These are friends of his. And we heard at 7, verse 7. God calls them into question and says, You haven't acted as I would have wanted you to. Now go and make the sacrifice. And Job will pray for you. Job is to pray for those who turned against him. He's to make intercedence on their behalf. I ask you, my friends, 
Is this the not the most difficult of prayer to make? Could you readily pray for someone who has hurt you? Maybe used you? Abused you? Could you pray for such a person? For their good well-being for the future? And why should, why should we pray for people who turn on us? This is the point. Why should we? Why should we intercede on their behalf and plead for their good being? Well, again, we're told why. We're told at verse 10 that by praying for his friends, Job was released from his captivity and doubly blessed. He was doubly blessed. By his prayer and his intercessory prayer for those who had been against him, God repaid him. God brought back everything that he had lost and gave him double. He freed him from the affliction that he was under by praying for somebody else. My friends, I would suggest this evening that the double blessing that we receive for maybe praying for similar people who we may hold a little thing against is that we too will be released from the captivity of our anger, our annoyance. We are released from that captivity. And we may indeed look upon these people in a different fashion. Charles Spurgeon gave an anecdote of an old minister he knew who said that after one service many years ago, one of the congregation stood waiting for him, tapping his foot. He said, sir, I would like to speak to you about the standard of your services. To which the old minister is reported to have said, of course, brother, let us step into the vestry. But before you bring to mind what you'd like to say, may we pray together? And the anecdote has it that both sat down and prayed to God. And when they'd finished praying, the minister said, what would you like to say? And the man said, nothing. I've forgotten what it was to pray for someone. The double blessing also that comes up, not only may we be released from any anger or bitterness that we hold, but also that the person who we pray for is improved by our pleadings on their behalf. Can you imagine standing before a court for a man or a woman who has stolen something from your house and saying to the judge, Judge, let them go. Forgive them. I forgive them. Let them go. What effect would this have upon the person who's there standing, being on the receiving end of this mercy offered by you? It's a double blessing because it releases us from what we may hold against those who have sinned against us. And hopefully, by the prayer reaching God, it will affect them accordingly. There may be people who we know who annoy us, who get on our nerves, or are a bit irritating. I hope I'm not one of them, but if I am... <laughs> If you go to them and say, I'd just like to tell you, you're a bit annoying really. <laughs> you really get on my nerves. <laughs> what reaction will we get? Do you think they'll say, oh, thank you very much? <laughs> it's very unlikely, is it? Their back will come up and they will get a little bit annoyed. But if we pray for them, pray for them, take it to God and say, Lord, these, they may have some things which could be addressed with your guidance. Let the Lord do it for them. So there we have an intercessory prayer for our sinners. But we see in our New Testament reading from the letter to the Ephesians from Paul. He brings it to people who we may not have expected. At verse 15 he says, Therefore he prays for those who have faith in the Lord and their love for the saints. Who have love for the people of God's people. He's praying for God's people. Now, do we need prayer? We're God's people. We're not sinners. Do we need prayer? My friends, I would suggest that we do, as much as anybody else. For we are, as a church community, we are the body of Christ, aren't we? We're the body of Christ. You may be the arm, I may be the leg. Maybe the knee, the toe, but we're all 
the body of Christ. And when one part hurts, you may have a part of your arm that hurts, but you know you may feel the pain in your hip. It will spread. So when one of us hurts, we all hurt. Can we live with fellow believers, see their sorrow, maybe their distress, and never cry out to God on their behalf? Can we hear of a good thing that's going on, maybe a venture that they're involved in? Can we never call out for a blessing for them? Of course we can. See, I see intercessionary prayer through, through the church is like a pulse. It just throbs through the body. It's there for us all. And let us not forget, my friends, once and, once and for all as well, intercessionary prayer is an honour. It's a great honour to be able to plead for somebody else. Why? Because it harmonises us with Christ. Christ sits at the right hand of his Father, interceding on our behalf. When we pray, have mercy on us, Lord, the Lord will intercede for us. What greater honour can we have than to do the same for others? To offer our prayers for others as Christ offers them for us. May I ask you a quick question? If we say, if the Queen happens to drop a letter through your door tomorrow and say, please come to the palace, come to Buckingham Palace tomorrow, and I would like you, I invite you to ask for anything that your friends want. Anything they want, I will, as the Queen, will grant that for you. Would any of us say, I'm sorry, Your Majesty, I, I'm a bit busy? We wouldn't, would we? We would get our best bib and tucker on and be running to London. We'd be there before the gates would even open. In the same manner, we have the ear of the King. We have the ear of God to ask for our brothers and sisters what they may want. How often should we do it? Once again, Paul tells us. How often should we pray? Once, once every month? Once every week? Every year? Paul says, he does not cease to pray. Always be praying. Always be praying for our brothers and sisters in life. And if I'd like, if, I, if, I, if you don't mind this bit of indulgence at this point, if you think to yourselves, well, I don't have anybody to pray for at the moment, Pray for me. I'll always gladly take a prayer. It's a gift that I'll gladly accept. Pray for me. If you've got nobody else, think it will. Pray for Lee and that pigeon this morning. You know what happened. <laughs> Everybody else will fill you in about the pigeon. <laughs> pray for me. It's the greatest gift, isn't it? To pray for others is the greatest gift we can offer. It's a wonderful blessing, isn't it? To plead on behalf of someone else. So my friends, if you are stuck this Christmas, this birthday, this anniversary for a gift, put your hands together and just pray for your brothers and sisters. It's the greatest gift experience you can give them. God bless you and Amen. Amen.